court basically starts out, you know, saying that conduct within the outer perimeter of duties is presumptively subject to immunity, mm -hmm. and that conduct that's not within the outer perimeter of duties is not. And then you get into the question of what what is and what is not within the outer perimeter of the duties, and the yes. court ends up taking a very broad view of what is within the outer perimeter of the duties, and they do it in part by looking at specific of allegations within, uh, within the Trump uh, indictment uh, and in the January 6th case. And we can go through that if you want to in terms of the, the, what they said. And what they ended up saying was, geez, a lot of, effectively, there's possibilities that a lot of the things alleged could be subject to immunity. Well, and so that gets down to the delineation between official acts and unofficial acts and what exactly could be prosecuted. But what's noteworthy is the court today also ruled that even evidence re regarding official acts cannot be incorporated into a trial whenever, if ever, that takes place. How consequential is that part of the ruling, that not only the prosecution is in question, but what you can enter into your arguments well, uh, if you're it, a prosecutor? It's, very, it's quite consequential, and it's, and it's I think... Highly questionable, because as, as Justice Sotomayor said in her dissent and, and as um, Amy Coney Barrett said in her concurrence, this is not what the law is. Mm -hmm. this, that's not what it's been. I think more consequential is the way the court spun the questions about what is. Two things. What is within the, the outer perimeter? And secondly, if it is within the outer perimeter and therefore presumptively subject to immunity, how do you decide whether there is immunity or not. And in both of those ways, the court has sort of set this thing at an angle that makes you think, and, and then the other thing is, they're gonna get the last word. They're gonna get the last word because this is gonna be bounced back to the district court. Yeah. District court's gonna have hearings. It's gonna answer these questions that the court has said have to be answered. Then it's gonna go back up on appeal. And if so the court wants it- So why not just answer it now? <laughs> How what? Why wouldn't the Supreme Court just make those delineations itself, well, they, knowing it'll ultimately come back to them anyway? Well, they did. They did in one instance do that. They they made a ruling that the former president's actions with regard to the attorney general, the mm -hmm. DOJ situation, where he he has control of who's the the attorney general, and he took some steps to replace the attorney general, and he leaned on the attorney general to send a letter to Georgia and stuff like that. And essentially, the court said, well, well, that's within the outer perimeter of his duties. Clearly, he's in charge of the Justice Department. But with regard to three other categories of conduct, the court said, basically kind of said things that said, well, it, it could be subject to immunity, mm -hmm. and we're going to remand it. But those categories are indicative of, really? That's really subject possibly to immunity? And so it puts a spin on it that causes one to wonder really how accountable the president can be within this framework. That's a great way of putting it. And I wonder broadly when you consider the fact that we're even having this conversation now, the American experiment rejected the idea of having a king. Right. Now I realize you still need to be elected, but it kind of sounds like you're a king for four years. Is that not right? Well, I, I you know, let's hope not. But I, but I, you know, that's a that's a spin one could put and wonder if it isn't true because <laughs> it depends a lot on how these issues turn out. I mean, for example, one of the categories that they focused on was the allegations, which we're all familiar with, about mm -hmm. Trump interfering with calling state officials, calling local officials, yes. trying to influence the state vote count, which is the job of the states to do. It's not the federal job. It's not his job. It's, it's not arguably really within the scope of any job he's got, unless you think he's in charge of everything. <laughs> um, so, and the court said, well, gee, hmm, that could be within the outer perimeter, so we'll yeah, demand that. Right. We'll send that back to the district court. Uh -huh. um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the ultimate thing that they did that's most alarming, one, one of the most alarming things to me about it is that for all these things that may be arguably within the outer perimeter of responsibility, which the court seems to think is very, very broad, mm -hmm. including speeches given on, on uh, January 6th, for example, yeah. communicating with the public. Well, that's the president's job to mm -hmm. communicate with the public. Um, but so what's the test for deciding whether 
you're going to defeat this presumptive immunity for things that are within the scope, arguably. And it's whether, um, uh, whether, whether, whether a prosecution with regard to it, the, the quote from the case is, could pose any dangers um, uh, of intrusions on the authority and function of the executive, any dangers at all, hmm will justify immunity, according mm -hmm. to the court. Well, so when you consider the kinds of questions that were raised in the arguments back in April, one of them was, could the president tell SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival? Under this framework that the court has just put forward, declaring that, including being commander in chief, that whatever you're doing in actions officially as president is prone to immunity, you could be immune from prosecution, would, would that to be inclusive as we consider well, you, what anyone could do in the future? You tell me. I mean, if, if the test is, would it, th this is the only test the court provided, would it pose any danger of intrusion on the president's exercise of his powers? Mm -hmm. And if you apply that test, you tell me. And whether, in the case of Donald Trump, for instance, this was one example drawn by Robert McWhorter in our last hour. There are documents showing he talked to Russian authorities about opening a hotel in Moscow. If you decided that was a national security threat, that might fulfill the qualifier. It, it, it could. And, and then just to stress the fact that what, what's been set up here, and this is getting to be a pattern when, in the court's cases more broadly with regard to um, how ultimately issues are decided, mm. they are centering more and more final authority on themselves uh, with regard to administrative law issues i mean we've just we've just experienced the mm -hmm. the, uh, the the repeal essentially of the chevron doctrine which yep. recognized discretion in administrative agencies when the statute's ambiguous and they come up with a reasonable interpretation well that's gone and so it's going to be the courts that are going to decide what the statute means bump it up to us and we'll tell you mm -hmm. we'll tell you what, how to read that statute well, this is the same thing. Bump it up to us, and we'll tell you whether or not um, this poses any danger mm -hmm. to the exercise of discretion by the president. Well, good luck with that yeah. mm -hmm. in terms of how that's going to turn out. It's going to turn out the way f five justices want it to turn out. That's right. And, and it, the, it, right now, this group doesn't seem inclined to limit the president very much.